Hello everyone and thank you all for coming. My name is Matthias Kirschner and I brought a book for you today and I will read you the story of Ada and Sangemann, a tale of software, skateboards and raspberry ice cream. And then afterwards I'm looking forward to have some discussion with you about how useful this book might be for your work or for um, talking with people about issues you care about. Once upon a time, there was a small girl named Ada. Her family was so poor that all their savings fit inside a cookie jar. They didn't have enough money to live in a proper home. Instead, Ada lived with her mother and her little brother, Alan, in a hut near a junkyard on the edge of town. Far away, at the other end of town, lived a famous inventor named Zangemann. He was immensely rich. No sheet of paper in the world was big enough to show his bank balance with all its numbers and zeros. He lived in a huge house with a swimming pool and water slide, lots of staircases and towers, hundreds of windows and so many rooms that he often got lost in them himself. Zangemann's mansion stood high on a hill. From there, he could look out over the whole city. Computers had fascinated Zangemann ever since he was a child. When he was young, computers were huge machines with lots of cables and loud, noisy fans. At school, little Zangemann often dreamed of all the things he would do with computers if they were just a little bit smaller. Small enough that they could be built into other fun things. He knew what he would do. First, he would build a computer into his skateboard. So that he would make cool noises, uh, so that it would make cool noises when he rode it. Maybe a fire engine siren or the sound of a rocket launch. And then he would use the computer to invent ice cream making machines. The computer would mix the coolest flavors and even sell ice cream. There would be machines on every street corner and he could get ice cream in his favorite flavor whenever he felt like it and just as much as he wanted. After that, he built a cleaning robot and a block sorting machine so that his room would always be neat and clean. Zangemann had great news ideas like this every day. He could think of nothing else. As the years went by, Zangemann grew bigger and computers got smaller. In fact, by the time he finished school, they were so small that they fit into his pocket. The smallest ones even fit on his fingertip. Finally, I can turn all my ideas into real things, Zangemann exclaimed, and he got right to work. He found ways to put the small computers into all kinds of things to make them even more fun and useful. And then he sold them. Adults and children loved his inventions. All the kids wanted to have one of his skateboards, complete with the latest sounds to show off their friends at school. Kids also loved his speaker invention, which could instantly play any song you requested. And of course, anyone loved the ice cream served every afternoon from the automatic, extra delicious, original Zangemann ice cream machine. It all seemed like magic, but the secret was simple. The little computers that Zangemann built into his machines made it all possible. These inventions were very popular at Ada's school, and many of her friends rode around on the cool skateboards. Ada was often sad, since her mother couldn't buy her any of those great things. No skateboard, no speakers, no ice cream. Luckily, Ada lived right next to the junkyard. 
There were lots of broken gadgets and rusty parts, which she put together to make cool new things, like a soapbox she and Alan rode roaring down the hill, a windmill, a scary chunk monster, which she and Alan would fight together. She also found many useful items, an old cell phone, for example. The screen was cracked, but she could fix that. And while there was an internet at the junkyard, she could get access somewhere else. Ada had so much fun tinkering in the junkyard and fixing broken things that she forgot all about the skateboards and the ice cream. Because everyone bought his inventions, Zangemann soon became the richest person in the whole world. With all his money, he bought a huge golden computer with a keyboard made of jewels and set it up in the largest room of his mansion. From there, over the internet, he could control all the little computers built into his inventions. All he had to do was press the proper key on the golden computer and immediately all the ice cream machines in town would dispense only vanilla ice cream. If Zangemann wanted people to eat chocolate ice cream, he pressed the key for chocolate ice cream. If he gave the order for lemon ice cream, the machines made only lemon ice cream. Zangemann loved his inventions and, it all, and was always thrilled how amazingly well his machines worked. Sometimes people were disappointed with their, uh, when their favorite flavor wasn't available. But what could they do? After all, there was ice cream on every street corner. Zangemann had a lot of fun pressing the sparkling keys and watching people eat ice cream. He spent many hours every day in front of his golden computer doing this. Again and again, he looked down on the city through a long telescope, observing how reliable his inventions carried out his commands. When he wasn't sitting at his golden computer, Zangemann was building his little computers into new devices and then selling those. He built washing machines that sent a message to your cell phone when your laundry was done. He made vacuums that played happy music instead of droning loudly. He invented light bulbs that turned on and off with the snap of a finger and cars that told you where the nearest grocery store was. Soon, almost every appliance in the world had a Zangemann computer built into it. Not all the inventions seemed necessary at first, but people bought everything he made. That's just the way it was. Everyone wanted to have the devices made by Zangemann, the greatest inventor in the whole world. One day, Zangemann thought, today I want to see my inventions up close. He put away his big telescope, then climbed down the many stairs of his mansion and ventured out in the city, full of anticipation at the thought of enjoying his cool devices. Maybe a little trip with might even give me a few new ideas. If I'm completely honest, my last inventions weren't quite as useful as the first ones, Sangemann pondered. But my ice cream machines are and will remain second to none, he thought immediately afterwards, and not without pride, as he was passed by a group of people all eating coconut ice cream, the flavor of the day. He was completely absorbed in his thoughts when suddenly, bam, something crashed into his shin. Zangemann yelped and looked around for the cause. He startled, a startled child stood in front of him, holding an original Zangemann skateboard under his arm. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that, the child stammered. But Zangemann wasn't listening. An angry Zangemann limped away. Suddenly, he heard loud music. 
he had never before heard something so horrible. He looked around and saw that the music was coming from a loudspeaker he himself had constructed. A child across the street was holding it. The child seemed to like the music, but it gave Zangemann a terrible headache and his mood, mood, uh, and his mood worsened. This was not how he had imagined his walk. Zangemann was so furious with the two children, how dare they use his inventions this way. That night, he couldn't sleep, so he sat down at his golden computer. From there, he gave all the little computers in the skateboards a command that they were no longer allowed to go on sidewalks. He ordered the small computers in the speakers to play music only at a low volume except for his favorite music, which he immediately turned on to get into a better mood. The next day, there was a big commotion at Ada's school. On the way to school, the kids' skateboards had stopped working. The wheels simply stood still, and the children could no longer turn up the volume on their speakers. What was going on? Although she didn't own any of those things, Ada wondered why the skateboards and the speakers suddenly stopped working. But she didn't really have time to think much about it, because she was tinkering again. She put together a complete bicycle from the parts of three broken bicycles. She gave the bicycle to her mother as a present so that she wouldn't have to spend her money on bus tickets to work. For her brother, Ada built a loudspeaker so he could fall asleep to nice stories in the evenings when their mother was still at work. After a few days, the initial shock at Ada's school was forgotten. The skateboards still didn't go on the sidewalk, but apart from that, they still worked. And so now the children rode in circles around the playground and listened to soft music. Only a strange, pompous, marching music continued to play at an unchanged volume, which the children found rather puzzling. Ada loved Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, her mother and Ellen would pick her up from school and they would all go to the library together. Ada was always drawn to the technology section. There were books with blueprints, instructions for experiments, and explanations of different on how different devices worked. In the library, Ada could also go online with her cell phone. She quickly realized that there, were also, that there was also much to discover on the internet. There, many people shared their ideas and repair tips to help others. On one of those afternoons, Ada learned two new words, hardware and software. Hardware was a word for something Ada already knew, the electronic devices she tinkered with after school, or those devices she could hold in her hands and try to fix or make into something else. What was completely new to Ada was the word software. She soon learned that it meant instructions that ran on a computer to control other devices or computers. Some books call those instructions programs or code. With such a computer program, one could, for example, tell a loudspeaker which song to play and how loud. The best thing about Ada's new discovery was realizing that she could tinker with the software just as she could do with the hardware. Hardware is built with tools, hammers, drills, and screws. Software is built by simply writing down the commands for the hardware one after the other. There was a separate language for this, the programming language. With software, Ada could make her inventions even more useful. She really wanted to learn the programming language. Over the next few weeks, Ada spent her afternoons in the library. 
she found books and websites that explained how programming languages and code worked. For Ada, it felt a bit like learning a secret language or like study, uh, studying vocabulary in school. Ada ate it all up. She expected her first program to do something simple. Make this lamp blink. Of course, she wanted to try her program out right away to see if it really worked. At the junkyard, she connected her cell phone to a small LED lamp. Then she typed the lines of code into her cell phone. At first, nothing happened. Ada wondered where the error could be. She made a few small changes and tried it again and, yes, the little, the little light began to flash. On, off, on, off. Ada looked at the LED in amazement. She had written her first program. Ada was totally thrilled. She imagined all the great things she could do. If she just entered the right code, she could make her inventions do exactly what she wanted. It was not so easy, but after a few weeks, Ada wrote a truly useful program. One that would make Alan's speakers automatically turn off half an hour after he had fallen asleep. Ada also had an idea for the next program she would write. It was a bigger deal, a real project. She would probably need the whole summer break for it, and she could hardly wait. Zangemann had slept horribly every night since his terrible walk on the city. When he went to bed each night, worries blagged him. Oh no, my marvelous inventions. It can't be that everyone just plays around with them. All the things that could go wrong. I put so much thought into everything down to the last detail. Zangemann pondered and pondered and tossed and turned sleeplessly in his bed all night. Waking up one morning with a deeply furrowed brow, he made a decision. He needed to make a change. Zangemann sat down at his computer and wrote one program after another. In these programs, he specified exactly what his inventions were to do and were not to do under any circumstances. The chaos had to stop. Once he was done, he sent all the new programs from his golden computer to the people's devices. He ordered his speakers to play only his favorite music whenever he was within earshot. He programmed the ice cream machines to stop selling ice creams in the afternoon. After all, he didn't want his expensive clothes to get stained with ice cream while he was out for a walk. All day long he sat at the computer and typed and typed and typed. Summer break was already halfway over. Ada stood in front of her big project and scratched her head. She had built a skateboard from old parts and then connected a motor to make the wheels turn. With a motorized skateboard, Ada could zoom to the library or the junkyard even faster after school. Super practical. But it didn't work. When she stood on it and pressed the go button, the wheels moved, but way too fast. Ada fell off the skateboard every time she started. No matter what she tried, she just couldn't get it right. After falling on her button for the hundredth time, she went back to the library. She always found answers to her questions there. And indeed, on the internet, she came across a program that someone had written for an electric scooter that also needed to start slowly. Ada downloaded it to her phone. Back at the junkyard, she adapted some lines of code for her skateboard program. She tweaked a few things and kept tinkering. Several failed attempts later, on the last day of summer break, the time had finally come. Ada stood on her skateboard and pressed the go button. And the skateboard started moving. 
slowly at first, then faster. It worked. She tried to break. It worked. Ada let out a cry of joy and took a trip to the park. When Ada rode her skateboard to school on the first day back after summer break, the other children were amazed. During recess, Ada's curious classmates surrounded her. How can you ride your skateboard on the sidewalk? They asked. Ada thought for a moment. I don't think it's your skateboards, but actually the software in them. It's probably programmed into the software that the skateboards aren't allowed to go on the sidewalk. But that can be changed. That evening, Ada tested out her theory on her classmate's Tony skateboard. She worked secretly through most of the night, and the next day, Tony could ride on the sidewalk again. Unfortunately, his skateboard could no longer make the sounds that his parents had bought from Zangemann. Instead, every 10 minutes, it made a strange noise that sounded like a drawn out burp. Ada knew that little errors like that could pop up in programs all the time. But Tony's burping skateboard was really quite funny. More and more children started to visit Ada at the junkyard after school. And she helped them rewrite the programs in their skateboards. Some of her classmates were very excited about this new discovery. It was unbelievable what you could do with the software code. They wanted to learn everything Ada knew about programming languages and soon they were riding their skateboards again wherever they wanted. But that wasn't all. With the software they could give their skateboards new cool features. Marie attached colorful LED lights to a board that glowed different colors depending on the speed. Conrad built old propellers onto his skateboard for extra speed. Ada, Tony, Marie and Conrad spent many afternoons at the junkyard. They even set up a real workshop where they could fine-tune their programs for hours, listening all the while to music from the speakers Ada had built for Ellen. Your brother's speakers are much louder than ours, remarked Tony, who was busy attaching a speedometer to his helmet. I'm sure that's also because of the software, Marie said. Together, they changed the software for the speakers too. Then they turned up the music as loud as possible and danced widely together. Every day, Ada and her friends made plans together for the afternoon. From a broken ice cream machine, they built a new one that could make ice cream in every imaginable shape and color. They ate square ice cream, heart-shaped ice cream, and even, even pyramid-shaped ice cream, as well as strawberry, raspberry, and rainbow ice cream, all with sprinkles and hot fudge. Much better than the varieties from the Zangemann machines. Sometimes they could even help adults. Tony reprogrammed his father's ironing machine so that it could also iron ties again. Zangemann had forbidden the machines to do so because he hated ties like the black. For the bus driver, they built an automatic watering system out of old hoses and a computer so that her plants would not die of thirst during summer days. And they helped the school custodian modify his vacuum so that it automatically recognized toys and wouldn't suck them up. Some things they built just for fun. Like the fart machine they put in their math, math teacher's chair. Whenever Miss Garnett sat down, the machine played a little fart sound. The teacher would scold them, but Ada was sure that she secretly smirked a little every time. One day, Zangemann noticed that some computers no longer obeyed his programming commands. Shocked and fuming with anger, he called the president. In a quivering voice, Zangemann yelled, 
Someone is rewriting the programs in my devices. That can't happen. After all, they are my inventions. It's far too dangerous if everyone can do whatever they want with the computers. You must make a law against this. The president did not want to upset Zangemann. All the government's computers were programmed by Zangemann. Without the computers, the government would not be able to run the country. So they passed the law as Zangemann requested. All computers that do not listen to Zangemann are banned. Anyone who reprograms Zangemann's devices will be fined 500,000 gold pieces. When Ada and her friends heard this, they were furious. This is unfair, they said. We built and reprogrammed our skateboards ourselves. They are much better now. We won't let anyone take that away from us. They gathered in front of one of their rebuilt ice cream machines and discussed the situation. It was clear that something had to be done about a new law and they made a plan. The next day, they didn't go to school. Instead, they rode their skateboards to the parliament building with large protest signs under their arms and sat down in front of the building. The evening before, they had put LED lights on some of the signs which were now flashing brightly. They had connected their speakers together so everyone in the street could hear what they were saying. Some passerby stopped and asked the children what they were demonstrating for. For software freedom, they replied in unison and told the adults their story. Impressed, the adults nodded and the president also looked curiously at their signs as he approached the building. On the following day, Ada and her friends again sat down in front of the parliament building, this time with support. Some classmates came whose skateboards Ada had reprogrammed. Tony's father and other parents and adults also wanted to support the protest. They found the children's devices very useful. With each passing day, more and more children and adults joined the protest. The bus driver they had helped drove up in her bus. She honked loudly to attract even more people to the protest. The custodian brought a few friends and Tony's father brought his colleagues from work all wearing perfectly ironed ties. Even Miss Garnet came. The crowd grew and after a few weeks there were protests not just in Ada's city but also in many cities throughout the country. Ada protested in front of the parliament building every week, even in pouring rain. On one such rainy day, when the president passed the group of tripping wet children, he couldn't help but admire their stubbornness. He asked Ada, why do you sit here every day? What do you want to achieve? Ada replied, we want to determine for ourselves what we can and cannot do with our computers. Her friends shouted in unison, don't wreck our tech, don't wreck our tech, and we want the code, we want the code. The president looked at the determined faces of the children. Honestly, he too wanted to decide for himself what the government could and couldn't do with computers. But he didn't understand anything about computers and code, so he had always left it to Zangemann. Deep in thought, the president entered the building. The next day, the president invited Ada and her friends over. We also want to be in charge of our software ourselves. In order for that to be true, the government must be independent from Zangemann. Can you tell me what you know about computer programs? He asked them. Enthusiastically, they explained him how software works and what you could do with it. The president was amazed. 
With this new knowledge, the government would be able to design its own software the way it wanted, completely without Zangemann. Immediately, the president called his advisors. In a large group, they discussed with the children everything they could change and improve in the software. That evening, the children went home proud and satisfied. Something finally happened. Their long protest was worth it. The next day, uh, the next morning, the president's phone rang very early. It was Zangemann. He was angrier than ever. Without me, the government computers will no longer work, he threatened. But the president kept the call short and quickly hung up. The phone rang many more times that day, but Zangemann's calls went unanswered. The president sat in a meeting with Ada, Tony, Marie, Conrad and the government's experts. In the days that followed, they talked from morning to night and designed their first programs for the government's computers. They were no longer disturbed by Zangemann's calls. Tony had the good idea of reprogramming the telephones. When Zangemann called, he only heard an automated recording. The government only wants to use software that you can freely use, study, share and improve. Thank you for calling. Then, after many weeks of protests and discussions, the time had finally come. They abolished the old Zangemann law. Instead, the government announced, everyone is allowed to program their own computers as long as they adhere to the other laws. In addition, a new school subject was introduced, computer hardware and software. That evening, everyone celebrated with a big party. Ada, Ellen, Tony, Marie, Conrad and other children from school and their parents, the president, Miss Garnet, the bus driver, the custodian, they were all there. They decorated the streets, listened to loud music and ate ice cream as much as they wanted and in every imaginable shape and color. While the others continued partying late into the night, Ada and her friends slipped away to their workshop. They already had a lot of ideas for new inventions and they wanted to start right away. And Zangemann? No one's heard from him. Maybe he's still sitting angrily in front of his golden computer. Maybe he doesn't dare go out into the street anymore and has boarded up all the windows in his mansion so that he doesn't have to worry about what other people are doing with his inventions. But maybe he also sometimes looks into the world through his telescope and sees what the children are inventing every day. Perhaps then he will remember how much fun it was for himself to tinker and experiment. And maybe, just maybe, he eats pyramid-shaped raspberry ice cream with rainbow sprinkles. That is the end. So beside the, the story, I have a few points I wanted to, to mention and then also go into the questions with you. So um, the, uh, the book, it's uh, published under Creative Commons uh, by ShareLike. And uh, so the English version, you can already pre-order it now worldwide and it will be then available from August onwards. Um, so it helps a lot if people pre-order and then we can show uh, some publishers out there that you can actually sell books which are under free licenses. Um, tell others about the book. Um, recommend or it to libraries that they, that they get it. Or um, we also in Germany, we had several people that um, bought them and donated them to the library. So that also children whose parents could not afford buying a book or don't see this book uh, that they can also get into tinkering with technology. Um, I also heard that uh, apparently some people love to give it to colleagues, uh, customers or friends because they told me that uh, finally they then understand free software. Um, I can also uh, highly recommend uh, to read this book to 
others, like for example, to go to a school. Um, our experience is that uh, schools, they are very interested to get people to read uh, books to children. And I did it now for the last uh, months and almost 1,000 uh, children and adults. And I can just tell you, it's, it's so great to be in a room with uh, children, read this book, and then see what kind of questions they have, and then talk with them about technology, free software, ethics about technology, and, and all of that. And uh, young, young girls coming to you afterwards telling you, I want to start programming, and I want to do a skateboard with these features, and uh, that's my favorite ice cream. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, I can just recommend that to you. And we have um, we have all the slides I used here and all the texts with um, which uh, places you can click available in a Git repository. So you can uh, take a look at that in different languages at the moment: um, English, German, Ukrainian, Arabic, uh, and uh, Italian should be in the repository. And uh, yeah, and then make use of the free license. Uh, change what. You want to change, but uh, where you think that you can make the story a little bit better and uh, yeah, distribute it. Um, it's uh, something that actually, uh, for example, the French Ministry of Education, they translated this book together with, um, with some people who uh, become teachers into French, then printed uh, 400 copies and distributed that to teachers. So all possible through CC licensing. Um, and um, yeah, they are also one of few other things I wanted to show to you. If you don't have time to do anything, as a charity, I have to mention that uh, you can donate to the FSFE <laughs> to help us to, to do those projects. For example, we had uh, we printed 2,750 copies in Ukrainian and um, paid for translations so that uh, we were giving that to organizations working with refugee children and also organized some readings for them. And uh, they were also then, after this went so well, there were donations then to do um, an Arabic version. And we printed uh, 7,000 copies in Arabic and distributed that to organizations. So, yeah, that is very helpful for us. Here, just a few pictures. Uh, that's from school in uh, Ukraine who got the books. And that was actually something a few weeks ago. I got an email that uh, the English book I, <laughs> I gave to someone, they brought it to India and were... Uh, reading this there in in one uh, place there and now want to translate it into Hindi as well. So yes, that's some of the examples here. And yeah, now I'm interested in your your questions. Um, yeah, do you have any questions about about the book? Any questions about how to start readings? Which, I, as I said, I can highly recommend. It's a lot of fun. Afterwards, you have so much energy. You can go through all those problems you run into at your work. <laughs> Yes. Oh, wait one second. <laughs> Simple question. Where can I find the book? The book, uh, you can order that now on, um, you should be able to order that on every bookstore, on a platform to pre-order it. And if you live in the US, you can already order it and, and get it there, but else uh, it's from August onwards. And it's very helpful, I mean, depending on where you order it. Uh, um, yeah, you create the, the demand and then the, the bookstores see about that. And I mean, the, the goal with, for us was also that um, you can, we want to get out of the bubble. So, I mean, we could do that with uh, printing that on our own and distributing that on our own. But we want to work with, with publishers who can then also make sure that this is in bookstores where um, families find that who have nothing to do with software before. So, and yeah, on, on nostarchpress.com, you can already order it when you're in the US, else it's, the, the shipping is a bit expensive, and then from August on, it's, uh, it's then available worldwide, but you can pre-order it and see what uh, funny things some of those platforms do when people are pre-ordering, how the ratings go up and down, and that, that's uh, science on its own. <laughs> and, and beside that, it's of course also helpful as I said, with the other things, uh, the, when we had the German book, one of the um, success factors there was that a lot of people talked about the book and recommended that to others on some platforms, uh, in some mailings, and uh, then like librarians talking with each other, people posting about it, uh, explaining why 
what what they like about the book so that that helps a lot so in the in the end a lot of the success of the, the book uh, depends on how useful people in the free software community find this book as a tool for them to communicate what what we are doing and um yeah then further spreading that like some some companies uh, they they now also did uh, bulk orders because they want to encourage more uh, girls in in stem or they um they want to give that to their uh, to their um staffers so that they can better explain it to their family what they are working on so yes we have five four minutes <laughs> sorry for another question <laughs> Would I be allowed to use your slides um, for a girls for IT event? That, that everyone can use the slides. Perfect. So the, Just the slides to reconfirm. The, right? the, the, the slides are available on, on git.fsfe.org slash fsfe slash ada minus Sangeman. It's uh, when we go back to the to this link, you also find this there. You also find a link to the uh, commercial publishers that published books before the, the German and the English one. And it's all under Creative Commons by Shell Like. So you can take the text, you can modify that, you can, if, if, if you are a genius like Sandra, who did this great illustrations, you can change the illustrations. <laughs> For me, it's easier to change text, but you can do all of that. You can uh, even, I mean, you can, you can make a new version and, and sell it. It's, it's all allowed with this license, like with free software, so. You can include it into the next uh, release of your distribution uh, as a added uh, gift or yeah, whatever you want. It's uh, or not whatever you want. There are some restrictions with the license as with uh, free software licenses, but yes, please use it. Um, modify it to, to fit your audience. There were people, they want to work on a simplified version so that you can already use it for kindergartens to introduce them a bit into programming. Um, yes, I, I'm very happy to receive uh, notes, what happened, and else uh, just with the feeling that at least you could do nice things with it <laughs> when I don't know about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. And um, yes, and I also uh, I gave one English and one German book to the to the Open SUSE board as as a gift, so that they can maybe share it a bit in the in the community as well. So yes, maybe you can have a look at the others here to to look into the book. Okay, then thank you all for listening here, and uh, I hope the the book helps you in your next years when you want to communicate more what you are doing or you want to encourage more people to join what you are working on. And um, yes, thank you all for being here and thank you all for being involved in the OpenSUSE community and working for Software Freedom here. Thank you. <laughs>